Hello, Internet. Welcome to Game Theory. Last episode, we unearthed the linchpin in decoding the Petscop mystery, that this haunted game is really just a device for training AI to perfectly replicate the behaviors of people in the real world. We actively see it happening in episode 17, where a load of test subjects are unleashed into a situation, in this case a replica of Marvin's house, and the ones that manage to find their way out the front door are selected to create the next generation of test subjects. This is the principle of a Darwinian learning algorithm. Over time, those generations become more and more sophisticated, until the AI is finally thinking like the person that the game's creator is hoping to replicate. Further adding to this theory are the patterns in the game's autosave files, and the fact that these recordings progress from Generation 1 to Generation 15 three separate times, indicating that this isn't a game generation, but rather a generation of AI. If you haven't seen that last episode, watch it now, because that information, and a general understanding of the Petscop series is essential for today's episode, as we piece together what I believe to be the definitive solutions to the major loose threads in this series. Who is Paul? Why is the character Belle here? What's the deal with the creepy schoolhouse scenes? And why is this story being told to us in this way? All that and more today, as we continue to close the book on the scariest game you, luckily, will never have the chance to play. Let's start with the primary question of Petscop. Can someone be reborn. We've seen a number of references to birth and rebirth throughout the series, from a cryptic note in the quitter's room reading, can you remember being born, to Tiara's hypothesis that some children can be psychologically damaged beyond rebirth. This is the primary goal of Petscop the game, to rebirth people using AI, to quantify everything about an individual and then replicate that person in a digital format. As we talked about last time, Raynor uses it to rebirth Marvin, so he can find a hidden grave. He then uses it to rebirth Care to find out what happened to her on the day that she went missing. And he tries to use it on the character Belle in his attempts to rebirth Tiara, except something goes horribly, horribly wrong. So, that's the what of Petscop, but now we need to figure out why. We know bits and pieces about kidnappings and plucking eyebrows and children dying, but how does it all tie together? Now that we know what we're watching, why are we seeing it? Why are we watching what amounts to an AI training simulator? Well, strap in, because this one is a doozy. Today, we solve Petscop. And let me just say, in all my years of doing theories on YouTube and solving these sorts of video game puzzles, this one ranks up there as a personal favorite, because this one was so thoughtfully put together and was incredibly difficult to logic out. You'll see what I mean here in a few minutes. Let's start with the basics. A family tree. Midway through Petscop 17, we have all our main players laid out for us via a series of text boxes. Care is actually Carrie Mark, a girl born in 1992 who was kidnapped by her father and kept in a school building for five months. Her parents are Anna and Marvin, something that we had already pieced together in previous uploads. What we didn't know, though, is that she also has an uncle named Thomas, an aunt named Jill, and a cousin named Daniel. Now, that new information may seem unimportant, but it allows us to make a connection to literally every other important person in this entire series. Daniel is actually Rainer, the creator of Petscop. We know this from episode 19, where Mike's playthrough finds a literal easter egg that we're told was hidden in quote, Daniel's game. Since the game is Petscop, and since Raynor created Petscop, this tells us that Daniel and Raynor are one and the same. And since Raynor and Mike are brothers, as we've established in the past, that means Mike Hammond, the dead kid, is Care's cousin as well. And so this whole side of the family now becomes the Hammonds. That scene from Petscop 19, though, is interesting for another reason. It tells us the origin of the game itself. Petscop began as a game for Mike, a place to literally hide easter eggs. We see Mike being the first person to play it, over and over in the save files. We know that Mike loves video games based on the PlayStation controller design on the walls of his room in the mysterious child library, and so what this tells us is that long before it became an AI training simulator, it was a gift. It was a gift from brother to brother before one of them dies prematurely in a tragic accident. But more on Mike's face later. Going back to the family tree, we also now know how our Let's Player Paul fits into this big web. I've long suspected that he's a part of this family, but now we have confirmation as to exactly where, and it all goes back 
to the windmill. Back in Petscop 9, we were given this riddle about Marvin's past. It's a line that I've quoted many times in all of the different Petscop theories, but here it is one more time. I was looking through your things. I found that picture of you from 1977 standing in front of an old windmill with your friend. You went there, and it was a bad idea. Your friend and the windmill both disappeared into thin air. Her sister was holding the camera. You married her sister, and years later, your friend was reborn as your daughter. What did you do? Based on this letter, we know that Windmill Girl and Anna, Marvin's wife, are sisters. But Petscop 17 gives us the necessary information to connect the dots. In that video, the AI is able to unearth a secret grave belonging to a young girl named Lena Leskowitz, who died at the age of nine. Based on the face on that gravestone, which matches this face back at the windmill, we know that Lena is Windmill Girl, which makes her Anna's sister and Marvin's missing friend from all those years ago. In summary, all this information confirms that Petscop is the tale of three connected families, the Hammonds, the Marks, and the Leskowitzes. But how's this tie back into Paul? Get ready, because this one is just brilliant. If you look at the first mention of Petscop online, it was via a Reddit post entitled Videos of a Mysterious Unfinished PSX Game from 1997 called Petscop. There's something hiding in it. The one and only post on Reddit made by a user named P.A. Leskowitz. Paul Leskowitz. But Paul's connections go deeper than just being related to windmill girl Lena. He also shares a surprising number of similarities to Care. Throughout the series, bit by bit, we learn of a growing connection between these two characters. In episode 11, Paul mentions that the two are exactly the same age. I remember you saying that we were, that we, we are, um, exactly the same age. Then, he admits that he looks similar to Care. I do agree there's a resemblance. Very strong resemblance between us. Even conversations that he's had in the past seem to make their way into the game, only they appear through the character of Care. I think that was based off of a conversation that I had last year on my birthday. I'm getting pranked. And for someone who's connected to this family and has some passing awareness of who these people are, even Paul can't believe that he wouldn't remember the emergency of Care suddenly going missing. I just don't remember even hearing about anyone going missing. I mean, I was a kid, but even then. When you take all of this information in the context of a Darwinian learning algorithm, the evidence is clear. Paul is another iteration of the Care AI coming from the same generation. Remember last time how I said that each generation of AI features hundreds of possible candidates set out to to accomplish a task with only the strongest performers being selected? Well, Paul is one of those, and he's made the cut. He is, in essence, another iteration of care, one that's made slightly different choices, but is still passing this test. That's why they're the same age, why they look the same, why he can't remember anything about her disappearance, and why they're having similar conversations. It would explain why there would be so many instances of weird syncing between the episodes, where movements are perfectly recreated from one playthrough to the next. It's all iterations of AI playing through the same movement patterns. That's also why there's this repeated question posed to Paul of remember being born. He can't. He wasn't really born. He was created. It's also why Paul has a room in the child library alongside Mike and Care and Lena, despite never having any connection to this game prior to his playthrough. But when I found my room, I was shocked at first, but it made sense that it would be tied in some way to me through you. And since, according to that letter, we know that Care is a reborn Lena by the transitive property of equality, it means that Paul is a reborn Lena too. That's why, in Petscop 15, whenever you pick up a party hat trinket, you're immediately dragged back to this picture and the word girl. The party hat is the object that appears on Lena's gravestone because she died on her ninth birthday. And Marvin, as represented by Green Tool here in these school sequences, is dragging you back as he tries to reprogram you, all in his attempts to rebirth his long-dead friend Lena. But Paul is a real person playing this game, I hear you saying. We hear him physically moving in some room that he's playing in. Yes, that's absolutely true, but it doesn't dis count him as an AI. Consider this. In Petscop 20, we see Marvin's playthrough. At the beginning of it, it seems like he's having trouble distinguishing his left from his right. He then pulls up the control menu, and what do we see? That left and right on the controller are reversed. So now rewind to a much earlier part of the series, and what fun fact do we learn about Paul? That Paul, too, has trouble telling his left from his right. Righty-tighty-lefty-loosey, or, you know, you turn this, turn this thing to the, to the right. 
And I mean, I still get confused about that. Whether he's real or digital, that confusion would stem from him being born out of a system where the controls are reversed. I mean, I told you this series was deep. We're talking the control schematics. You can just tell how no detail throughout this entire series is too small to matter. It's just unbelievable to me how tightly scripted this whole thing is. It's really impressive, especially for something that has such a casual feel to it. I'm sorry, I just really love this series. And the game has clearly established a connection between the real world and the game world. By cranking up the exposure of various loading screen transitions throughout the series, we're able to see real-world versions of various in-game objects. Stairs down into a basement, a piano hooked up into a PlayStation, and perhaps the most chilling one of all, Care's box of spilled crayons from her room in the child library. These bridges between the game and real-world objects are solidified by Petscop 16, an episode which, in my opinion, is the most disturbing installment of the entire series which features an emergency distress warning as well as a live feed of something identified as the ghost room. By the end of that video, a dot, which is tracking something, slowly makes its way over to the chair and begins doing something with this, the TV. To me, it's pretty clear, whatever it is in that room, it started to play Petscop. Notice in the corner a wheel that should look pretty darn familiar. It's the same wheel that cycles through different iterations of the AI for any given generation. But we can actually go one step further with this little clue. It's set to the same alignment that we see Care's AI in at the end of Petscop 17. So what could all of that mean? Well, to me, it seems to indicate that the Care AI has somehow been able to transition out of the game and into the real world. And it's now being very closely monitored in this observation room. At the very beginning of that same video, for a brief moment, we can actually glimpse some text on the pause screen. Quote, the ghost room is a ship in a bottle. Now, that's certainly vague, but here's how I interpret it. A ship in a bottle is a perfect replica of a real-life thing, but it's kept preserved and protected inside of its bottle. You can look, but you can't touch. The ghost room, then, is just that. A place where replicas of humans are made, preserved, protected, and then observe, without any chance that they'll be able to escape. Further supporting this idea is Pickled Sarcasm on Reddit, who pointed out that calling it Ship in a Bottle may be a reference to a 1993 Star Trek episode of the same name, where characters from the holodeck become real as they basically will themselves into being physical forms. Which is why it's finally time to talk about Belle. Up until this point, I've tried to focus the narrative of this theory and this game around family, because that makes sense. It's nice and it's concise and all the pieces fit pretty cleanly together. But then you have Belle, a character who the game outright tells us isn't part of the family. A character, though, who seems unbelievably important to the plot and is clearly tied to something very, very bad happening in the world of Petscop based on this progression of safety file names, but whose role in this thing is vague, to say the least. But here's the thing, Belle is the linchpin to proving that people can cross into and out of this game. Based on the progression of save files, we know that Belle was one of the game's earliest human testers, and she was good at it. Relative to all the other playthrough snippets that we watch, Belle is quickly able to solve all of the game's puzzles. But then something happens, and apparently she's gone. She's trapped somewhere, presumably inside the game, and she's still good inside the game too, as we see her actively able to hack into the game from the inside, so much so that she's now able to change texture files. This potentially leads her to eventually escape, as in episode 12, we're told that she's finally free, that she's somehow been rescued, that she's been running the game, aka trapped inside of the game for over 17 and a half years. But most importantly, Rainer asks her this, are you still sitting on a chair? Can you still look around the room? Is there still a room? This all shows that the ghost room is real, and that Belle, at least at one point, has been sitting in a chair in a real room, and that upon getting rescued, she's back in that real space. A real space that Marvin was also apparently in. In one of the most crucial bits of lore that I've ever covered in this series ever, in the final five seconds of the final episode of Petscop, minus the dance break, we get the big reveal as we enter a pause screen that exists inside of another pause screen, we're left with the concluding message of your butt leaves
leaves a cavity in the chair. Yep, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. The final clue in this epic multi-year mystery is a quote about a butt groove. But why? What's this telling us? Well, it tells us that the chair is real, the cavity is real, and that once you pass through a couple layers of meta, your butt is real too. I'm dummy thick. Your butt is the answer. That is the final note of Petscop. Or is it? Because we still have one final set of clues to look into. The road, the pets, and Tiara. Up until this point, we've broken this series down into very small pieces, just like you work on a puzzle. A chunk here and a chunk here, all united by themes or colors. But now it's time to step back and assemble the bigger picture here. The actual story of these 21 episodes. How do all of these individual events connect? What really did happen to Mike and Tiara and Lena and Rainer? Where is Paul and care now that some AI is out there in the real world? And what does the future of Petscop hold? If indeed there is a future to Petscop. All that is coming up in what I predict to be my final Petscop theory, where we get away from a lot of the finer details and tell the story that this game is trying to tell us. It's honestly not going to be next week, because honestly I could use a break from covering Petscop, and I'm sure you'd like to see me cover something else, but it's probably going to be another week or two. If Petscop is truly the tale of three families, what exactly happened to those three families? Ha, <laughs> sounds like I'm rehashing FNAF now. Anyway, more on that soon as we conclude the series once and for all. But until that day comes, remember! That's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Watch more. Subscribe. Watch more. Subscribe.